I'm Justin Paynes. I flew uh, the Harrier predominantly, uh, the JSF X35, and uh, a lot of time on the VART carrier research aircraft. So when was your first flying experience? Uh, well, the first that, uh, um, that really struck me was with the RAF Air Experience flights, um, which I now uh, fly as a, a, a reserve pilot um, on, in the other role. But back then as a, as a teenager, a school child um, in the cadets, I remember flying a chipmunk uh, at Abingdon just south of Oxford um, and uh, well it struck me um, a great deal obviously as, as you'd imagine interested in flying anyway uh, it was a lovely experience um, which I remember, literally remember to this day and after that again with the Air Training Corps I, um, I did a gliding course uh, which is the first time I went solo so my first time ever alone in the air in an aeroplane uh, was in a glider <clears throat> and again it's something you don't forget uh, I still remember that, that feeling suddenly realizing I was in the air and there was no instructor behind me to help out and so it really was uh, up to me and it was a uh, actually very liberating experience in some ways realizing right this is it it's you now uh, you're on your own in the air and of course uh, there have been many times I've been solo first solo since in different airplanes first solo in in, in the jet provost and the hawk and the harrier um, and of course drone strike fighter but uh, actually that very first time in a glider at West Morling in Kent uh, as, a, as a cadet a teenage cadet was uh, was the one I remember the most so what year did you join the IRA? I joined in 1988. Did you always know you wanted to be a pilot? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, going back to your earlier question, I, I was always interested as a boy. Then as a teenager, lost a little bit of interest with, you know, the other things that, 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 that become important to teenagers. Um, uh, but uh, around about the time that the uh, space shuttle started flying, and at university, I was uh, very lucky to be selected for the University Air Squadron. Uh, and those two things together both rekindled my interest in flying in an aerospace. Uh, and also I found out surprisingly I was quite good at flying. And when you find you're quite good at something, then you tend to enjoy it more and want to do it more. And, and that's what I discovered uh, with the University Air Squadron. So that's really how I was recruited to the RAF was uh, through the University Air Squadron. So after you joined, when did your training start? Well, uh, 1988, January it was, I joined, so you started uh, with initial officer training at Cranwell. Uh, back then it was a three-month course, um, uh, boot camp, if you want to call it that, quite hard work. Um, uh, but uh, graduated from that in uh, May 1988 uh, as a uh, pilot officer. And uh, then because the training system was backed up, I had to, to do what was called holding for a while. Uh, so I had various uh, ground jobs with the uh, Eurofighter uh, project office for about six months before uh, starting my uh, flight training, basic flight training, towards the end of 1988 uh, on the Jet Provost at Church Fenton. Uh, so, uh, and then I just went through the, the standard uh, training process, so it was Church Fenton on the Jet Provost, streamed for fast jets, uh, so did a, a fast jet leading course uh, again on the Jet Provost at Church Fenton before going to Valley, uh, getting my wings on the Hawk at Valley and then TAC weapons training as it was called back then which was at RF Brody uh, before I was streamed onto the Harrier. So after your basic training, um, you got streamed to Harriers. Can you tell us like, how you got selected for this? Yeah, well, you were selected on, uh, on aptitude um, at tank weapons training. So after Valley, which is all about flying and advanced flying, uh, AFT, it was called advanced flying training at that time. Uh, you get your uh, wings awarded at the end of that course. And so you've done some beginnings of sort of tactical maneuvering and, and, and how to position in formation and so on. But it was after that on the following course, that, which was called then uh, tactical weapons training, uh, tactical weapons units, TWUs. Uh, there was RF Chivener and RF Brody, both of which are closed now. Um, and it was your performance through that weapons training where you did air to ground and air to air training uh, that was used to select you for uh, either single seat aircraft, Jaguar or Harrier at the time, uh, or two seat aircraft. And so I was fortunate to, uh, to do well enough uh, to be selected for the Harrier at the end of that course. So were you happy about the being selected for Harrier? Definitely, definitely. It had always been uh, the airplane that I wanted to fly. So after you got selected, how long was your training? The Harrier uh, conversion course uh, is, uh, was at uh, about eight months, I think, um, which was an interesting uh, comparison. If you look at, for example, the Jaguar, an airplane with a similar role at the time, ground attack, was about a three or four month course. Um, so almost double the conversion course at what was called the operational conversion unit. Um, and that was because you more or less had to learn to fly again because the Harrier doesn't fly like a normal airplane. So the first half of the course was learning to fly the Harrier. Uh, and the second half of the course was learning to operate the Harrier. 
Whereas uh, Jaguar or Tornado OCU, you know, you only needed a few sorties to learn to fly the airplane because it was a conventional airplane. Uh, so it was about eight months uh, conversion to the Harrier, after which I joined uh, one squadron uh, in uh, 1990. And then on the squadron, you have what's called a combat ready workup. So you spend a number of weeks or months uh, as a junior pilot uh, being trained on the squadron, on the job, as it were, uh, until you're declared combat ready and then able to, um, uh, to go into combat zones. Now, it's interesting that the training never stops because after you're combat ready, that then you work up to be a pairs leader and then a fours leader and, and so on. So in a sense, uh, in flying uh, training, uh, which is dedicated training, but even in flying operations on an operational squadron, uh, you're always training and always learning, except those periods of time when you're actually on operations. So how many people were selected for Harrier? Um, well, on my course, which was number three course uh, for the GR5 Harrier at the time, there were, I think, seven of us. Um, and the rate at which people were, were posted to the Harrier over the years you know, varied uh, with the requirement. Um, but I should think, I, I'm guessing there were sort of 10 or 15 a year on average, two courses a year of, of maybe seven each uh, through, through the bulk of the years of the Harrier. That's my guess anyway. So could you tell us what your first flight was like? First flight? Um, I don't remember specifically the first flight. Um, we, you know, it was, it was very quick after this, this taxi test where you're taught to, to, to accelerate and brake literally. And that's you know, because the Harrier is such a, such a beast. That's why we had to do it that way. The first flight was with uh, essentially fixed nozzles on the approach. So uh, flying the Harrier in a semi-conventional manner. You'd actually drop the nozzles um, to about 60 degrees for landing, but you would still fly it more or less conventionally because um, although some of the weight of the aircraft was being carried by the thrust, the, the technique uh, on stick and throttle was, was relatively conventional. Uh, and you did, uh, you went solo on sortie number three. So two, two sorties, so that the taxi test that I explained earlier, then uh, two sorties with an instructor uh, really doing circuits, take off and landing pr predominantly. Uh, and then you went off solo. Uh, and I do remember it being slightly scary um, because again, the Harrier is such uh, a beast. I mean, it's a relatively difficult airplane to fly, uh, immensely powerful, very high thrust to weight uh, with some very um, um, poor handling qualities in certain areas, which I can say now as a, as a test pilot. One picture I do have very clearly in my mind was my first vertical takeoff. So I think that was around about sortie number seven or eight. So you, you do your three sorties, the third one being solo in sort of semi-conventional takeoffs and landings. And then you'd learn to hover, doing vertical takeoffs, vertical landings. And then you're sent out on your own on about um, sortie number eight. Uh, in a GR3 with these massive great intakes and the GR3 the, the canopy sat a little bit lower than, than this which is a, a sea harrier and you have these huge intakes sitting literally right by your head here um, sort of hunkered down in this little cockpit very much a 1960s design cockpit and um, I still remember that feeling a bit like that first flight in the glider when I slammed the throttle so you, you get the nozzles obviously you do some checks on the engines you put the nozzles down into the vertical position so they're pointing straight down and then you slam the throttle to full power and then there's a few seconds while the engine spools up and the airplane lifts the ground. And I remember again this fixed image in my mind of having slammed the throttle to full power while I was waiting those few seconds for the engine to spool up and the airplane to lift the ground, you know, thinking almost, you know, what have I done? Kind of, kind of not, not those words, but that sort of sense of, oh my gosh, this is it and off we go. Uh, because again, there was no one there and, uh, and there are some dangers in, in vertical takeoff where, you know, you could end up with the airplane rolling upside down if you didn't get it right. So um, there was a certain degree of apprehension. And, uh, and I remember that, that, again, that picture very clearly, um, that moment. Uh, How does it take to master? Um, to master the Harrier, maybe a thousand hours to oh, truly oh, master oh, okay. it, to <laughs> truly master it. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, you can argue that you never master it in certain respects, but certainly you can be you become comfortable, um, you know, after, after a year or two flying it, you become pretty comfortable. Uh, but to truly master it, I mean, who knows? Uh, a lot, a lot, you know, the, the more you do, uh, the more comfortable you get and the better you get. And if you're talking particularly about VSTOL, vertical and, and short takeoff and landing, uh, that's what I assumed your question to mean. So what was it like having all that power at your uh, disposal? Well, it's very exhilarating. I mean, you know, I think um, people sometimes ask me, what's your favorite airplane? And, and, and there are certainly more elegant airplanes than the Harrier. There are certainly high performance airplanes than the Harrier that I've flown. But the Harrier uh, has a very raw, power, a very raw um, performance uh, in that it's very manual, uh, you're very much connected uh, to it, you know, with, 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 the, with the nozzle control and, and the throttle, um, it, you know, it's, I think raw is probably the best adjective and so um, it's a tremendous challenge and it's tremendous fun is what that really means and 
so you know, coming back to the question that people ask about my favourite aeroplane, is that there are others that in some ways uh, are nicer, better aeroplanes that, that I could consider my favourite in some respect, but there's nothing that quite compares to the Harrier. I don't think there are many Harrier pilots that wouldn't say the Harrier is, is their favourite and best aeroplane because of uh, um, the, the challenge uh, and the raw power and the, the very manual, if you like, the very uh, manly uh, way of flying. So what was the main role of the Harrier? Um, well, there were two Harriers uh, in operation in the 90s. There was the Sea Harrier, this one which had an, an air defence role, uh, so uh, an embarked uh, operations on our uh, CVS carriers at the time, uh, and they carried uh, air defence radar and air-to-air -air missiles. The GR5, 7 and 9 uh, aircraft in the RAF uh, had a ground attack role. Um, so um, uh, while we could carry Sidewinder uh, heat-seeking air-to-air missiles and we used those essentially for self-defence and we could do some point defence, our role was, was actually ground attack, mud moving. So you said you were with one squadron, could you tell us a bit about this? Uh, one squadron, well the uh, oldest squadron um, in the RAF or in the Royal Flying Corps. It was formed I think in 1912 um, and its history actually predates that in the um, as a balloon squadron in the Royal Engineers I think well back into into the 19th century so it's quite a historic unit uh, as they're tracing its roots back to 1870s or something as a, as a balloon unit. Um, I, I, I'm not a history buff so I couldn't tell you all the things that the squadron did but uh, was uh, operational in the Battle of Britain. Um, and became a Harrier squadron in the uh, late 1960s with the, uh, the Harrier Mark I, uh, the GR1, uh, and remained a Harrier squadron right through to the end of the Harrier uh, in, was it 2010 or 12, I can't remember. Can you explain some of the good characteristics of the Harrier and the bad characteristics? Okay, uh, well, good characteristics, I mean, clearly the airplane was built uh, for, for the V-STOL or Stovall uh, capability. So V-STOL is uh, vertical or short takeoff and landing, or Stovall is another way of saying it, short takeoff, vertical landing. And the, and the aircraft was operated normally in that role. So you do a short takeoff and a vertical landing. The reason is that to do a vertical takeoff, you couldn't load up to max all up weight. You know, if you put too much fuel and weaponry on the airplane, then the engine thrust wasn't sufficient for a vertical takeoff. And so you generally do a short takeoff where you'd use a combination of wing lift and vertical lift. Uh, and then at the end of the sortie, when you'd burnt your fuel and or dropped your weapons, you had plenty of performance for a vertical landing. And so that was the main um, feature of the airplane, clearly. That's what it was built to be able to do. Uh, and much of the rest of it was a compromise in order to be able to do that. And that compromise had certain um, uh, serendipities, if you like. People uh, talk a lot about, and there's a lot of mythology about the Harrier as a dogfighting aircraft because of the ability to vector the nozzles and, and, and pull back the nozzle lever to drop the, uh, the engine nozzles in forward flight, vectoring in forward flight, viffing. Um, but uh, some of it, I, 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 I don't want to destroy the myth because it's a great myth, but some of it is a little bit mythological. Certainly viffing would give you an advantage um, if you used it right and if you used it against a pilot uh, who wasn't ready for it or wasn't experienced or didn't know how to fight a Harrier. But it was a quite limited capability because the trouble with viffing is you lose all your energy. Uh, a fighter pilot knows one of the things you want to preserve in a dogfight is your energy. Uh, and so uh, viffing was often a last stitch maneuver or if you could sucker the other guy to get slow and fight you slow in a slow speed fight so you could get both of you to, to exchange your, your, your kinetic energy for, for altitude so you haven't completely dumped your energy because you've got altitude now but you brought the other guy slow with you. Now in that instance, the Harrier could fight very, very well uh, because not only could you put the nozzles down to produce a little bit of vertical thrust, but more importantly, the reaction controls, the little uh, puffer ducts that control the airplane in the hover, those would activate. And so you could use the uh, reaction controls would allow you still to control the attitude of the airplane, even at very slow speeds, in a way that the opponent, uh, you know, in a, in a conventional airplane wasn't able to do. So, uh, Certainly there were some tricks you could play and uh, you, could, you could adopt um, uh, some of the special characteristics of the Harrier, particularly slow speed, against an adversary that wasn't very well experienced at fighting a Harrier. But anyone in, in an F-15 or F-16, which is a much higher performance aeroplane up and away, who knew how to fight in a Harrier, he wouldn't let himself get suckered into that position. And, and it was a hard job to beat an aeroplane like that. An equivalent pilot in an F-16 and a Harrier, uh, you know, you'd expect the F-16 to win. I'm sorry to destroy the myth. Um, however, go back to the Falklands, you know, Mirage 3s, um, uh, nothing like the capability of the F-15 and F-16 uh, performance-wise, so much more of an even match. And then with the, the few tricks that you have up your sleeve as a Harrier pilot with, with Viffing, you know, um, you can read the books from the Falklands and, and, and obviously the airplane performed uh, magnificently there. Um, 
so that's an air-to-air. In air-to-ground, uh, the compromises uh, from the, the, the design are basically you've got these big intakes which produce a lot of drag at high speed. Uh, you've got uh, the engine right in the middle of the aeroplane and so that produces some limitations in, in, in how you can carry external weapons, uh, fuel and so on. Uh, and so the aeroplane has um, uh, a good range, particularly the Harrier II, the GR579, uh, had a very good range but not for example the range of the Typhoon uh, or the Tornado. Uh, which is more contemporary, of course. So range and speed were compromised to an extent by virtue of the design being driven towards uh, to vertical takeoff and landing. Um, but taken as a, uh, as a whole, um, with the, the basing flexibility uh, from the, the, the vertical takeoff and landing capability, um, with the flexibility to operate at sea, uh, in, in a clearing, from a bare airfield, um, you, you couple that with not bad performance, certainly within the right hands, uh, both in air to air and air to ground. Um, you know, the airplane as, as a whole, as a, as a weapon system, was, was outstanding. But I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> so, can you tell us what type air uh, models you actually flew on the Harrier? Yeah, so I flew, uh, I started off on the, I did my conversion on the GR3 and T4, um, which is the Harrier 1 family, uh, which is an all metal airplane, you know, uh, designed in the, in the 60s and, and 70s. Uh, but right after learning to fly on the GR3 and T4, I converted to the GR Mark V, which is the first of the RAF's Harrier II family, so uh, carbon composite construction um, built by McDonnell Douglas and British Aerospace uh, together, uh, and much higher performance in terms of range and payload. Um, uh, and so I flew the V, uh, then the Mark VII, GR7, which was the same airframe as the V, but with upgraded uh, cockpit avionics and a night attack capability. Uh, and I did some of uh, some of the night attack stuff. Um, I also then, when I became a test pilot, I flew uh, the Sea Harrier. Uh, I flew the T8, T Mark 8, which was the um, latest of the uh, T birds, two seaters. And I flew the Vark Harrier Experimental uh, fly by wire airplane, which was originally a T2. Uh, so, uh, so between those marks, I've flown quite a few. I haven't flown the Mark 9. Uh, oh, I've, and the T10 as well. Uh, I've flown that, which was the latest. So we're getting confused with all these models. There's the Harrier 1 family and the Harrier 2 family, and they're all just numbered, you know, Mark 1 to Mark 12, um, with either a GR for the single-seater or a T for the, for the two-seater. Do you have a favourite? Um, well, that's, I, I mean, that's hard to say. It depends, uh, favourite for what? Favourite for bombing around the, the, uh, the airfield would have to be the GR3. Uh, favourite for going, going in, into... Uh, you know, going to where the nasty guys are, well, I didn't fly the GR9, but uh, obviously the GR7 was the most advanced there. Okay, well, um, I'd always been quite interested in, in, in test flying, wanted to go uh, the route towards uh, test flying. And so, um, to become a test pilot, you have to first be an experienced frontline pilot. Um, uh, with an above average rating and I think 750 hours uh, flying experience. So, and then you could apply. It quite simply is an application process once a year to apply to the Empire Test Pilot School uh, at Boscombe Down. Uh, so I applied, uh, I applied very early the first time, didn't get in. Um, there were others more experienced than I, and then I applied again in 1994 and uh, was accepted uh, not only for, for test pilot school, but also there's an exchange program with uh, the test pilot schools in, in fact, there's an exchange program with France, um, the French test pilot school, the American Air Force test pilot school, and the American Navy test pilot school. Um, I was, I think, very fortunate to get the exchange as a student to the US Air Force test pilot school at Edwards Air Force Base in California. So uh, I flew over there with my um, wife in um, January or late December, um, 94 for uh, the course through 1995 so one-year course 12 month course well 11 months so it takes the full year um, very intensive course uh, but uh, probably the best year career-wise of my life in some ways really exciting I flew uh, all the American frontline types uh, all the way down to the B1 bomber which is an extraordinary airplane um, uh, so I mean all but all the fighter types um, f-15 f-16 f-111 f-18 uh, through that year. I flew the A-10 uh, with, uh, and fired the gun with that 100, 100 rounds or so in the A-10, again an immensely capable airplane. So what was your favourite out of all the types you flew? Uh, I think my favourite airplane, uh, aside from the Harrier, was the F-15. Um, really, really nice pilot's airplane. A lot of power, a lot of thrust. Um, 
and um, and just really nice handling quality. It's really comfortable and easy to fly, uh, coupled with the power as well. Um, Can you fly lovely. the C or the E? Uh, I flew the C model, or in fact the two-seater version of it, the B. So what was your role over there as a test pilot? Was it just to test the platform or did you, was it weapons? So, well, uh, test pilot school, I was learning to be a test pilot. So as, a, as I said, an 11-month course where you're being taught test flying. And it's, test flying is very different from operational flying. And so it, it takes quite a long time. There's a lot of academic learning. Uh, there's a lot of engineering involved. Uh, because the test pilot in many ways is the, is, is the, is the go-between between the, the front line and the operational capability and the designers uh, and airworthiness specialists on the other side. And you have to know both worlds. You have to be an operational pilot with operational knowledge and background. Uh, and then you have to learn the engineering skills and the analysis skills for, to be able to bridge that gap and to be able to provide a, a, in, a, in a test flight an evaluation of an aeroplane at a technical level um, to, uh, to inform the, the designers and uh, airworthiness specialists. So a lot of academic stuff and then a lot of practical demonstrations. So all these aeroplanes I flew in the course of learning different test techniques and learning how to evaluate different aeroplanes and also there's an element in which they give you a breadth of aeroplanes to fly so that they develop your, the breadth of your experience. You're not just flown a thousand hours Harrier or a thousand hours Tornado and that's all you know and you think that's the only way to do business. You need to broaden a test pilot's uh, knowledge base so he sees lots of different operational types and learns lots of different ways of doing things so that he has a, a much bigger experience base to draw on. So that was the fun part of the car, of course, was the broadening. The, the engineering was the less fun part of the course, but overall it was um, f fantastic. Then you're also a test pilot at Boston Down. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so after I qualified as a test pilot uh, at the end of 1995 um, at the US Air Force Test Pilot School, I came back to Boston Down and did um, a long tour there um, as a test pilot uh, with two main main roles. I was the test pilot, uh, project test pilot for the VARC Harrier, Experimental Harrier. So VARC stands for Vector Thrust Aircraft Advanced Flight Control, VAAC. And that was an experimental Harrier, which uh, I can talk more about in a moment, with uh, fly-by-wire controls that we were developing advanced uh, flight control capabilities for, or technologies for, ultimately for Joint Strike Fighter. I was uh, also deputy project pilot on the uh, GR7 uh, and T10 and we did a lot of uh, clearance work on the T10 which was fairly new at that time uh, with uh, uh, weapons carriage and, and release trials and I was the project pilot for trainer aircraft as well so I did a couple of small um, uh, flight trials on uh, Hawk and on the Tucano. So could you kind of tell us a day in the life of a test pilot? Yeah. What was it like? <laughs> so. Um, Disappointingly, mostly paperwork probably. Yeah. Uh, uh, in between, you know, for every uh, every test flight, there's there's a lot of preparation. Um, so not only planning and safety assurance, because because test flying is potentially hazardous, uh, and, and nowadays it's very safe. And, and the reason we the way we've taken something that's potentially hazardous and made it safe is by a, a lot of attention to safety planning and risk analysis. And so. And a lot of that is just brainstorming, intelligent guesswork, if you like, but in a in a structured way. So you spend a lot of time planning flight tests uh, and then you go and fly it and then you spend a lot of time reporting flight tests so uh, you have to be as a test pilot willing to do that the, the, the paperwork either side for every hour that you get uh, airborne so I mean a typical uh, day in the life of a test pilot on uh, fast jet test squadron was the squadron at Boscombe Down in, in the late 90s um, uh, I suppose you'd fly most days uh, some of the flights would be proficiency flying so just uh, getting airborne to keep uh, keep your skills in intact uh, and then the rest of the day uh, would be uh, paperwork planning or reporting planning for or reporting uh, trials flights that were coming or that you'd just done uh, and actual test flights um, you'd do less often uh, one or two um, a week maybe uh, it depends on the project you're on it would be you know projects would come there'd be a lot of test flying for a, for, for a period of some weeks you might fly a test flight every day for a period of weeks and, and then there'd, there'd be nothing for a month or two while uh, you planned for the next one uh, I was quite fortunate on the VARC carrier we did a lot of test flying because it was an ongoing research program so the uh, flight control technologies were being developed all the time and we were flying them all the time and we were developing them iteratively so I was very fortunate to fly uh, I think um, three or th three or four hundred test flights in my in my tour um, uh, a large percentage of which were on the on the VARC carrier. How did it differ from flying in the US? Um, well at Edwards uh, which is where I've flown obviously the weather is always nice I mean 99% of the year I mean there's a you get a little bit of cloud up at 10,000 feet and they in their traffic control um, start worrying and shut down flying and stuff you know whereas we you know in the UK we're obviously used to flying in weather um, 
it's very easy to fly. You've got Edwards Dry Lake Bed or Rogers Dry Lake Bed at Edwards, which is massive. I mean, it's 10 or 12 miles long. And so it doesn't matter where you are because there are no clouds, you can see base. So you never get lost. Um, and um, it's, it's a pilot's paradise, actually. I mean, it's why they started flying there back in the, you know, in the 40s um, uh, because of you know, the weather and the clear air and the easy uh, navigation. Um, uh, it's a fantastic place to fly. Um, so that was sort of one obvious difference with, uh, you know, in that sense. In other respects, uh, test flying is pretty much the same around the Western world. You know, the, the, the test pilot schools have always worked together. We've always had these exchange programs. There's a lot of exchange of information amongst the Allies, so America, Britain, France, um, and, and the other European nations, even though they don't have their own test pilot schools, they send their students to those four test pilot schools that I've mentioned. Uh, and so the techniques and technologies are remarkably consistent uh, across the um, European and, and American manufacturers and, and, and air forces. So how long do you sp uh, spend at Boscombe? So I was at Boscombe uh, four years, four and a bit years from uh, January 96 until April 96. Um, uh, April 99. Sorry, it's three years, isn't it? You don't have to count to be a test pilot. Uh, three and a bit years uh, initially, and then I went off to the Joint Strike Fighter. After that, I came back to Boscombe Down uh, for my last tour in the RAF as an instructor on Empire Test Pilot School uh, for a couple of years. And then I, uh, as a civilian, I left the RAF in 2004, but then I stayed at Boscombe Down flying as a civilian test pilot uh, for another um, th uh, 30 or 12 years until 2013. So my interest in, uh, or my involvement in Joint Strike Fighter uh, started actually during my tour at Boscombe Down on Fast Jet Test Squadron. Um, I was, uh, be because of the work I was doing on the VAR carrier, which is all uh, advanced Stovall short takeoff vertical landing flight control work, uh, I was the obvious choice, I suppose, for um, being assigned to the Joint Strike Fighter program along with uh, my opposite number on the VAR carrier, and my deputy on the Harrier, which was, uh, who was Paul, Paul Stone, uh, a Navy pilot. And so the two of us were assigned together to work on the Joint Strike Fighter program. So we were involved in some of the meetings and some of the simulator studies that were going on through the late 90s. Uh, when the requirement came up for two uh, British pilots, um, one Navy, one RAF, then uh, clearly Paul and I were, were, were fortunate enough to be the obvious choices uh, to go over to the US and, and, and join the, the joint, force, uh, joint Test Force. Uh, flying the aircraft. The aircraft we were flying, this was a stage of the program called the concept demonstration phase. Uh, and the aircraft we were flying were experimental airplanes, so they were actually called the X-35 rather than the F-35, and the X-32 was the, the Boeing aircraft. I was assigned to the Lockheed Martin team flying the X-35. Paul Stone was assigned to the Boeing team flying the X-32. Um, and uh, we're involved again in, in, in now full time in the simulator studies and meetings and planning, flight test planning and so on. As, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, planning and management involved in any test flying. So, uh, but a lot of it was technical work in the simulator, developing the flight control laws uh, and then testing them um, in, the, in the simulator before they were ever tested in the air. Uh, but of course it led to uh, flying the airplanes, which was um, you know, very exciting. I mean, obviously, it's not often these days that a test pilot gets to fly a brand new uh, airplane. Uh, typically the job of a test pilot today is in, is in developing uh, new systems or new weapons for existing airplanes. So an airplane that he might already have a thousand hours on. Uh, clearly Paul and I were immensely uh, lucky and privileged to fly or be involved in a flight test program for a, a brand new airplane and a very different airplane, an experimental one at that. Um, so the concept demonstration phase with these experimental airplanes was for the two uh, competing contractors, Boeing uh, and Lockheed Martin, to demonstrate some technologies, to demonstrate that they could field and operate some technologies. It wasn't actually a fly-off like the, uh, some other competitions have been in the US where they get two manufacturers and there's a fly-off and a direct comparison of the performance of the two prototypes. This was very much concept demonstration uh, and to prove the manufacturers could, could, could master these technologies. Uh, and then after the, um, uh, the concept demonstration phase was finished, the winning uh, company was selected on the basis of their proposal of what they were going to build, and that was, of course, Lockheed Martin that went on to build the F-35, which was de derived from the technologies developed for the X-35. looks much the same, uh, but quite a lot of differences uh, beneath the skin, uh, as you might imagine. So what were your first thoughts when you saw the aircraft? Uh, well, I first saw it in, in bits in a hangar being constructed, so, uh, um, you know, and, and not in a very um, 
fast date of, 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 of completion when I first saw it. So um, the airplane evolved in, in front of our eyes and, and came together. Um, but uh, certainly seeing it for real, uh, it's quite a large airplane, surprisingly large, and um, sits quite tall compared to the Harrier. You know, Harrier pilots used to fairly small airplanes, which the Harrier is. Um, but um, uh, I suppose there was no great surprise because we'd sort of seen it, it you know, emerge in front of us as it was constructed. So can you tell us a bit about how much training you needed before you can even step in the cockpit? Okay, well, um, that's what Test Pilot School is all about fundamentally. So Test Pilot School uh, teaches you in part, apart from all the engineering and all the analysis and all the flight test techniques, uh, through this broadening that I mentioned earlier and, and flying lots of different types, it teaches you to be much more adaptable in the cockpit and to be able to more or less get into anything and fly it. Um, because you know the first flight of a new airplane, clearly you, you're no, you've not been taught to fly it before you fly it, and so you know although it's rare for a test pilot to be in that situation, it, it does occur. The X35 and the F35, there's, there's no two seaters, uh, so um, uh, you know the first time I flew it was, was was on my own, clearly. So the the test pilot training is a part of it that gives you the, the you know the necessary skills. But secondly, of course, there was a lot of simulator flying that I'd been doing for years anyway as a test pilot on the X35 program. And so I was very familiar with how the airplane flew in the simulator, uh, which made it obviously much easier to fly the real thing. Um, and a lot of technical training as well. So we had to learn the systems, emergency procedures, all the things that you learn as a pilot for any airplane um, in terms of emergency procedures and systems knowledge and so on. Obviously, we, we had to do that as well. So how did the cockpit differ from the Harrier? Uh, it was much bigger, um, quite a large cockpit. Uh, as a side stick rather than the center stick. Uh, so you're sitting uh, with your hands here, throttle here and, and side stick here. Um, had uh, obviously multifunction displays um, uh, uh, instead of uh, Harriers. Um, well, Harrier, in fact, the, the GR79 also had multifunction displays, smaller ones. Um, these were bigger. So in, I suppose in that respect, actually, it was quite similar, that the actual instrument panel was quite similar to to, um, to what I was used to, at least conceptually. The throttle and nozzle lever were very different. First of all, they were on the other side. So in the Harrier, you've got the throttle outboard and, noz and the nozzle lever inboard, uh, nearer the seat. And on the X35, the throttle was inboard and the nozzle lever was outboard. Uh, but actually, that, that, that didn't create a problem. It's quite easy to get used to. Uh, the throttle was an F-16 throttle grip. So whereas the Harrier, it's a, it's a vertical throttle, and it's partly it's vertical because you, know, you can put the nozzle lever next to it. The X-35 throttle was a, was a sort of horizontal handheld here with lots of HOTAS buttons, hands-on throttle and stick buttons on it. And that's actually why they couldn't put the nozzle lever on the inside because the throttle grip comes over the top, so they had to move the nozzle lever to the outside. Um, so that was very different. Uh, and also the uh, throttle uh, a nozzle quadrant was active, controlled, it was powered, so you could put different feel into the, the movement of the, no of the nozzle lever, and so you could have detent, so whereas in the Harrier there's a, a, a hover stop, which is actually a, a little um, a, a physical bit of metal, a little uh, step in the, in the travel of the nozzle lever, so you pull back against the hover stop and you know you're in the hover position. So in the, with an active throttle quadrant, you do that in the, in the software, so as you pull the nozzle lever back you get a little detent, a little resistance, that's uh, generated by the uh, by the motors, by the actuators within this active throttle quadrant. So you know, Harrier, 1960s technology. This was you know 1990s technology um, with active electronic everything. So uh, very different in that sense. So no analog dials anywhere. Um, I'm trying to remember now. I think we had um, a couple of backup analog dials um, uh, for altitude and, and attitude. Yeah. So what was your first flight like in the F-35? Uh, very exciting, obviously, you know, um, not only because of the sort of pilot excitement of flying a new airplane that, that had hardly flown at all. Um, uh, as, as a military guy and one of the junior guys on the team, I wasn't the first to fly it. Uh, because the, also the, the Stovall airplane, the short takeoff variant, the, the B model as we called it, was the last one to fly. And that was what I was really there for. But I did get to fly both the A model, the US Air Force variant, and the C model, the US Navy variant. Um, and uh, so there was the excitement of flying something brand new and, and quite so exciting as that. But also there was the fair degree of apprehension because, I mean, the airplane was a billion dollars worth. So I was responsible for that couple of hours for flying something that literally was, was worth a billion dollars and, uh, and probably worth more than that in the sense that if I had really messed up and, and crashed it, you know, you're talking about massive, massive impact on, uh, on Lockheed Martin, on the program as a whole. Um, and so there was a fair amount of apprehension uh, from that, knowing that literally I had a billion-dollar airplane that I was that I was in sole control of, uh, with no one else involved. 
uh, a little bit humbling, but uh, and the apprehension you feel as a test pilot, and this is not you know bravado or anything. I think every pilot's the same. Is is, is you're not worried about risk to yourself. You're just worried about looking like a fool and making a mistake. And uh, you know, please God, don't let me mess up. Is the sort of pilot's uh, prayer or test pilot's prayer because um, that's just the way humans are built and the way pilots are built. You know, your, your apprehension. Is, is making a fool of yourself and, and, and breaking something or crashing. Um, there's no real apprehension in terms of safety because you think it's fine. I mean, airplanes today, flight test today is so carefully controlled, so well modeled. It's not like in the 50s when you never knew what the airplane was going to do. Um, so a certain amount of apprehension, but the nice thing about it is, is once you get into the cockpit uh, and, you, and you close it down and you're firing up the engine, you're talking to the test uh, conductor on the radio, you just sort of slot into your normal way of operating. It all becomes very familiar and you, and you forget about the, uh, uh, the worries and you just get on with the job and you know you can do it and it, you've got to have that little bit of confidence. Uh, and if you've got that confidence, you, you, you don't worry anymore once you get going and you just get on and do it. And, uh, and that indeed is, is what happens. And it was a great flight. Uh, airplane flew beautifully. I mean, um, one of the technologies that we really triumphed in the West over in the last part of the 20th century from the sort of 70s onwards was the development of fly-by-wire flight control and how to make things fly very well first time. So early fly-by-wire aircraft, you know, the handling qualities were quite poor, quite hard to fly, but we developed the techniques and technologies to be able to predict how something's going to fly and design it to fly well. And both the X-32 and X-35 um, were evidence of that. So you know, the first time they flew without any changes to the flight control software from, from what had been designed, they flew beautifully. Really, really good handling qualities, really easy to maneuver, easy to uh, maneuver precisely. Uh, you, the airplane did what you wanted it to do. Um, resistant to all kinds of different pilots. Some pilots are, are, are very, what we call high gain. They move the stick a lot and frequently. Some pilots are very sort of relaxed and what we call low gain. And, and, and a, and a well-designed flight control system will, will, will tolerate both uh, kinds of piloting techniques and still uh, perform for the pilot, still give him what he wants. And if he wants to maneuver up that way, it feels naturally. You know, if he wants to snap to, to, to 5G, he can get 5G predictably and easily. When he wants to, to roll to, to 80 degrees of bank, you know, the roll rate is predictable so that he's not fighting the airplane. It's not like trying to balance a broomstick, it's trying to hold a, a mug. You know, the difference is about a broomstick, you have to sort of work at balancing, a mug just sits on your hand. And that's good flying qualities, uh, handling qualities, uh, where an airplane like the mug just does what you want it to do. It's easy to make it do exactly what you want it to do as you maneuver the stick. And, uh, and the, F, the X35 was like that. Absolutely uh, beautiful handling qualities. Uh, really comfortable, really easy to fly. So how did the hover function differ from the Harrier? <clears throat> okay, uh, not too much, in, in fact, uh, for the X35 very different from the for the F-35. So the X-35 had uh, manual throttle and manual nozzle lever, uh, just like the Harrier does. Um, it wasn't quite as simple as that because the uh, throttle goes through a, a FADEC, full authority digital engine control. And the FADEC is trying to optimize the engine as, you know, the, I don't know how many different actuators and sensors there are in, in one of these engines that the FADEC is receiving all these inputs and, and, and trying to control, you know, ultimately the fuel flow to the engine and all the variable uh, guide vanes and things in there. And what it meant is that the thrust of the engine would vary a little bit for fixed throttle position. And so, whereas in the Harrier, you know, when you get into the hover, you put the throttle in the right position, you get everything balanced, you're nice and level, and you put the throttle there, you sit there, relatively. You might then you'll slowly start to drift off, and that's why you're always making corrections. Uh, but in the X-35, uh, sitting in the hover, you are constantly fighting, you know, you're chasing a moving target, because the, the FADEC would be moving the thrust up and down, and you'd having to be, because you're trying to keep the thrust constant, so you stay in the hover, so you'd be constantly fighting uh, the thrust variations, as they like, like chasing a moving target. As the FADEC moved the, thr the thrust down a bit, you'd have to compensate with a bit of throttle up, and the FADEC would bring the thrust up a bit, and you'd be bringing it da down, and so on. And there were quite large, relatively large thrust variations. So surprisingly, hovering the X-35 was much harder than hovering the Harrier, certainly in terms of throttle control. Um, however, on the attitude control of the attitude, keeping it level in nose up, down, wing left or right, uh, the wing um, roll left or right, was much easier because the X-35 had a, a stabilized flight control system that kept the attitude constant. So if you let go of the stick, the airplane would go to a fixed attitude. Whereas in the Harrier, it's unstable or, or neutrally stable. It just would drift off. You let go of the stick, it, it's not going to stay there. It's just going to drift off because there's nothing keeping it uh, in a f constant attitude. So while in a Harrier, you're, you're always making little, little adjustments on the stick. 
Uh, hopefully, if you're a nice, smooth, competent pilot, you know, they're just small adjustments uh, just here and there. But as the airplane drifts one way, you just bring it back and drifts the other way, you bring it back. Uh, and, and similarly on the throttle, but, but not so much. So X35, very active on the throttle because of the FADEC that I just mentioned. But in terms of controlling the attitude, the airplane just sat there. You would only need to move the attitude if you wanted to move the airplane. So in the hover, obviously, we move the airplane by, by tilting it and therefore, you know, we, we start to slide sideways, just like a helicopter uh, or, or dropping the nose and we, we go forward or backwards. Uh, and so in that respect, it was much easier. Um, the only thing that would, uh, that would make it slightly harder is if there was a little bit of wind, which we had some, that would tend to drift the airplane off. Now in the Harrier, it's quite easy because you just go to, a, to an attitude slightly into wind so that any wind drag that's trying to blow you down wind would be, would be compensated. Well, I just explained the X35 would always try to go back to a level attitude. And, and, and you'd put the wing down a little bit to, to stop it drifting down wind or the nose down a little bit to stop being pushed backwards by the wind. But then as soon as you let go of the stick, the nose would come back up and you'd end up drifting back. So you actually had to trim the attitude. So with the trim button on the top of the stick, you could trim the attitude to you know, a couple of degrees nose down or that would be enough to hold it into a, a 10 knot wind. So uh, all of those things have been dealt with in the, X, in the F-35, but it shows the sort of level of maturity of, of, the, of the flight control system at the time. Uh, nozzles were, were, were nice. Uh, so although the nozzle lever then went to a bunch of computers, the flight control computer that would then position the, uh, you had the, the front nozzle, which was this big sort of pram arrangement, um, I forget what they called it now, that would, that would vector the, the, the front nozzle from the lift fan, uh, you know, forward, back, or, 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 or could be adjusted. And, and again, you had this big three bearing swivel back on, on, on the back of the airplane. So the nozzle lever would give you an average position. If you put the nozzle lever to the hover stop, the computers would work out what to do with these two actuators. So whereas, of course, the Harrier is nice and simple, you're, you're mechanically fixed to four um, simple nozzles that come out of the engine. In the case of the X35, that nozzle lever went through a bunch of computational stuff to position all these actuators and give you a resultant uh, vector. So, uh, and there were no real problems with that. That worked, that worked nicely. So what was the first time you hovered? What was that like? Uh, well, the, the first flying we did in the uh, X35B was, was in the hover. So similar to the uh, P1127 way back in the 60s, which was developed into the Harrier, the first uh, vertical flight we did was, um, uh, was starting from the ground doing a vertical takeoff. Uh, interestingly, Boeing took a different approach. They started with wingborne flight and slowed down gradually. And when I talked about the build-up approach where you get slowly faster and faster and faster, well, you can do the, the reverse. You start from a known area, 200 knots, and you go slower and slower and slower in stages and testing everything each time you go. If it's good at 190 knots, you go to 180 knots. If it's good at 180 knots, you go to 170 and so on. But we chose uh, in the Lockheed team, and I agreed with the choice uh, at that time to, um, I still do, to um, start just like the 1127 did over what we call a pit, which was a, a grating with a, a big pit underneath that ducted away the exhaust. So you, you could fly at one foot and you didn't have ground effect. Whereas over the pit, just like they used for the 1127 at Dunsfold way back, uh, we had this big pit at Palmdale that ducted all the hot gas away. So you could be flying one foot above, above the grating and it felt like you were in, in free air. And so it enabled us to test this immensely complicated set of engine and flight control systems uh, in uh, an incredibly safe environment, i.e. at one foot and zero knots. You don't get much safer than that. You know, and there, there, are, there are competing arguments for these two approaches that Boeing took and the X-35 took. And interestingly, the F-35 adopted what had been the Boeing approach. So they, they didn't, their first vertical flight was having decelerated from horizontal flight. They didn't do what we did on the X-35, which is to start, as I said, on, on the pit, at one foot and zero knots. Um, there are arguments both ways. Uh, I still favour what we did on the X-35 because it seems to me there's nothing uh, safer than zero feet and zero knots. You came off the pit, if you, if you ended up drifting forward and the front lift van uh, exhaust went onto the concrete off the pit, we thought we might lose the aeroplane. So it was, uh, it, it was high stakes stuff and, um, uh, and important to get it right. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. So could you tell us a bit about what kind of tests you conducted in the X-35? Yeah, so we were clearing the aeroplane uh, envelope. Um, as you do with any new aeroplane, you have to start slow and you gradually build up in speed and manoeuvre uh, towards the corner of the envelope where, where um, uh, you know, dangers can lurk. So, for example, flatter where you can get um, the aeroplane um, of flattering or vibrating, if you like, in the air, being excited by the airflow at high speed, and, and literally airplanes can break apart. So 
for example, you, you, you do flutter tests to, to make sure that there's no tendency for that to happen uh, at a certain speed. And if everything's good there, you go to a slightly higher speed and you test again. And if everything's good there, you go to a slightly higher speed and test again. And similarly in, in load factors, so from, you know, obviously you're starting off at 1G and, and, and you're up to about 1.5 in gentle turns. And then you'd go to 2G and 2.5 and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, similarly with the engine, you're, you're, you know, you're starting in, in relatively low speeds and low angle of attack where the engine has a nice clean airflow and you're gradually exploring and testing the engine at higher speeds, high angle of attacks, different altitudes and so on. And, and so you know, clearly you have to start where you take off and, and, and when, on the first flight you take off, you're at 150 odd knots or so on with the gear and flat down uh, and uh, you're going to just gradually stop, starting from that point, gradually build up in speed, altitude and manoeuvre testing all the components and all the features of the airplane and the aerodynamics and the performance and so on as you build up in speed. So how often did you fly? The, uh, very often, uh, very frequently. The uh, A model um, flew only for about four or five weeks and in that we did 30 flights I think. Um, and the reason is there's an immense amount of pressure on the program to get the flying done because the, the, the airframe, the same airplane that was the A model, which flew in late, uh, late 2000, um, October the something, um, that same airframe had to finish its testing as an A model and then they were going to take it back into the workshop and they were going to turn it into a B model. So they only ever built two airframes, an A model and a C model, and the A model was then converted into the B model, the B model being the vertical takeoff and landing one. So there was an immense amount of pressure to complete the flight test and get the airplane back in the hangar so they could convert it in time to complete the flight test on the Stovall, which was the last flying we did. So yeah, I think the airplane flew about 30 times in, uh, in a month or so, uh, and we were flying every day, um, weekends as well. I, th I mean, we might have missed the odd day, I don't remember for sure, uh, if, for, if, if, um, if anything had to be explored or unservice abilities, but essentially we were flying every day. Um, and multiple refuelings, so uh, we'd, we'd refuel at the end of the runway, um, and then we'd later, once we had the air-to-air -air refueling capability, that was developed too, that was tested too, uh, we'd refuel airborne so that we'd, you'd, you'd do quite a long sortie uh, and get a lot done, more than, more than just one fuel load. So could you tell us the differences between the A, B and C model? Sure. So uh, A model, the US Air Force model, conventional takeoff and landing, um, uh, is sort of where we start, it's a standard fighter airplane, uh, relatively short wingspan, 9G capable. Um, the C model for the US Navy, um, because of their requirement to land on, on ships, they need to go relatively slow in conventional flight. They don't have a 10,000 foot runway, they've got a um, you know, 600 foot runway, or, or yeah, 600 foot or so. So they have to fly a little bit slower on the approach. And so the wings are bigger, their wings are a slightly, a slightly bigger wingspan, and the tail is bigger, the, 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 both the, the, the two vertical fins and the uh, uh, stabilizers are slightly bigger to allow the airplane to fly a little bit slower. Uh, with still good handling qualities at, the, at those slow speeds. And that's the fundamental difference there. It also means they have got a little bit more space for some f extra fuel in the C model than they have in the A, but both A and C have masses of fuel, uh, a very capable airplane in terms of uh, range. So then the B model is essentially an A model that's turned into a vertical takeoff and landing airplane or short takeoff vertical landing airplane. It can do both. Uh, and what they did is take uh, a fuel tank out that sits behind the cockpit in the A model uh, or space for a fuel tank and put a lift fan in that's driven off the front of the engine. So the lift fan is, a, is, is like a vertically mounted engine, uh, jet engine without the combustion chambers. So instead of having a, a vertically mounted jet engine with combustion chambers and turbines driving the, the, the fan like you have on a normal jet engine, the lift fan is driven from the main engine with a big shaft, great big shaft comes out the front of the main engine uh, through a gearbox and clutch uh, assembly that then drives the lift fan. So you've now got li vertical lift um, uh, thrust from just behind the cockpit. Uh, now you need thrust at the back. So thrust at the back was produced by rotating the main engine nozzle downwards. They've got an ingenious arrangement of swivels that allowed the whole nozzle uh, swivel bearings they called, that allowed the whole nozzle to rotate down. So you've now got thrust at the back thrust at the front, you've now essentially got the, the basic components for a vertical uh, flying airplane. Then there are other things you need to be able to control it, so there are some small thrusters in the wings that just, similar to the Harrier, take high pressure air off the main engine, duct it out to, to little um, uh, uh, vents that are controlled by the flight control system to open or close and produce uh, roll control. Uh, and then your control is produced by, by, by moving the, the, the rear engine uh, so it's pointing straight down, if you rotate it a little bit left or right, you can, you can yaw the airplane around, turn it on the spot, 
and then um, pitch control, nose up or nose down, was controlled by varying the thrust out of the lift fan and the thrust out of the main engine. Uh, could be varied. So you increase a bit out of the lift fan, reduce the main, uh, out of the main engine, you bring the nose up and vice versa. Of course, all of that's done by the flight control system, far beyond the capability of a, of a pilot to control those manually because there are multiple actuators uh, operating at you know, high frequency compute, computational rates. Um, and that's really why you needed, compared to the Harrier, which was a genius a solution to how do you make something that's simple that can be controlled by a man. Uh, it came, comes to the 21st century, we want higher performance. Well, we don't have to rely on the man now. We can have computers do all this hard work and we just give the man the controls of where he wants to go at the top end of it. So um, I, my colleagues on the X-35, uh, there was a US Air Force a test pilot, US Navy test pilot, a US Marine Corps, and of course the contractor pilots as well, both um, uh, a British Aerospace uh, pilot who was working on the team because it was a joint venture between uh, British Aerospace, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed Martin and the American Lockheed Martin pilots. But uh, the call sign that we had for, for our flying was, was Hattrick because of course there are three variants, A, B and C models. And so someone had come up with our, our call sign as Hattrick. I was Hattrick 6 uh, as the sort of the junior member of the team. Um, being both non-American and, and, and be serving military rather than one of the older contractor pilots. Uh, but Turbo Tomasetti, who was the Marine Corps serving officer, my opposite number and a, and a good friend, he brought in a hockey, an ice hockey stick because of course in America, uh, they think of the hat trick as being three goals in ice hockey. Of course we know hat trick, I don't know where, where it origin, originated, but cricket or whatever. So uh, he brought in his ice hockey stick and said, well, I brought this as a, as a um, you know, so like a, a good luck charm or whatever. And um, we had to, the, the three, there were three of us uh, Stovall pilots, three Harriet pilots. So it was Simon Hargreaves from British Aerospace, uh, Art Tomasetti, Turbo from the Marine Corps, and me from the RAF. And so we were the only ones that did the vertical hovering flight. And that was, of course, why I was mainly there. So although I flew the A and C, I did most of my flying on the B and, and in the hover. The, uh, between the three of us, uh, there was always required someone to be what was called um, landing uh, safety officer. So LSO would be on the ground or LSS, standing safety supervisor, uh, making sure the wind wasn't too strong and uh, just being in charge of the local area with a, a radio, backpack radio, in, in, in touch with the airplane if anything went wrong. So if we saw the airplane drifting off the pad or whatever, we, you know, we could call directly to the pilot. But in, uh, we also had a, a role to, we had a little handheld anemometer because because the airplane was so experimental and new, we had a maximum of, of 10 knots of wind, or it might even have been five knots of wind, I don't remember. Could well have been five knots. So we'd hold this anemometer and the wind was, you know, sort of gusting three, four, four and a half, five knots, or, and, and then sometimes slightly over. And so Turbo, he took his ice hockey stick out there and stood ahead of the airplane with his handheld anemometer. And when the wind was less than five knots, he held the stick up in the air so we knew we could go flying. And if the wind went above five knots, he'd drop the stick down. So uh, anyway, so, um, Dave Matson was the British flight test engineer on the program. He was there. So he, he um, on a trip home, brought in a, a cricket bat and said, well, I've done that ice hockey stick stuff. A cricket bat. So when I went out as uh, LSS, uh, I used to have to hold the, <laughs> the cricket bat in the air to show that the wind was below five knots. But um, it was actually uh, great fun being out there near the pad because um, you're very close to the airplane and the, the, you know, the power and the noise is just astronomical when you, you know, you're 50 feet from this this monster you know it, it, it really is like primitive man would look at this thing like a, a, a fire breathing monster because it is I mean, your whole body is, is, is shaking with, with, with the sound uh, and this thing just sitting there in the air very very impressive at close quarters um, and so that was quite a fun part of it as well not just the flying so how many years did you spend on the X-35 and did you enjoy it? Well I loved it of course I mean highlight of the career in many respects very unusual um, to be involved with a flight test of a brand new airplane, an experimental airplane as well. Uh, it was about two and a half years in total I spent in America um, uh, from April 99 for two and a half years to span both the preparation for and then the, the flying uh, during the concept demonstration phase, uh, which had wrapped up by the time I left at the end of uh, or in the autumn of, of 2001. So Justin, do you have any hobbies? Uh, <laughs> uh, kids and flying, I think. Uh, kids have, t have removed my ability to do uh, any other hobbies. No, I, I, um, in fact, as they're getting older now, uh, the boys are a little older, I love, uh, I love the outdoors. I love fishing, scuba diving, uh, sailing, boats in general. Um, so anything in, involved in those sorts of things, uh, yeah. I love. I, I, yeah, I, I love the outdoors. I love nature uh, uh, and uh, fishing and, and, and so on is great. What is your favorite aircraft? Okay, I don't think I could 
ever say anything other than the Harrier. I mean, it's you know, it's not the highest performance airplane. It's not the most elegant airplane. It's not nicest to fly, but it's you know, it's like a first love. And uh, the exhilaration and the the skill required and the sense of achievement, there's nothing like it. So, is there any? Are you pretty much flown everything, but is there an aircraft you wish you could have flown? Yeah, I'd love to have flown, well there's two actually that spring to mind, similar vintage. I'd love to have flown the 104 Starfighter, I'd love to have flown the Lightning, uh, neither of which I have sadly. So how many hours of flying do you have? Uh, nearly 4,000, just less than 4,000. How many on Harrier? Uh, 1,200, 1,300. Which do you prefer, air to air or air to ground? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, I love both. Uh, uh, you know, I, I spent my career as an air-to-ground uh, pilot, mostly mud mover. Um, so, uh, you know, I suppose I have a, um, you know, my, my heart leans that way. But uh, there's nothing, uh, nothing to be a one v one dogfight as well with a, with a mate uh, on a Sunday, on a on a Friday afternoon before breaking for the week. Uh, it's uh, very exhilarating, very rewarding. It's the best sport there is. One v one, guns only. What was the hardest type you've ever gone up against? The hardest type to go up against? Um, well, I mean, I think, um, I think, I mean, the yeah, F-16 uh, is, is probably, um, I've not fought uh, 1v1 close uh, against an F-15, so I'm not really sure how to compare it, but uh, the later block, later model F-16s have just so much power, uh, and they can use the vertical so well that uh, it's very hard to defeat them in a Harrier anyway. So what was it like going from uh, level flight to the hover in the Harrier? Yeah, that was uh, uh, actually another of those snapshot moments. I still remember the first time I did it, which I was just a passenger in the back. And uh, it's an extraordinary feeling because as you, you know, once you've learned to fly, you're, you're very used to in an airplane as you slow down, you know, the nose comes up and then eventually, you know, you reach the stall. And what was so strange about doing this in the Harrier is first of all, you're flying along with a relatively level, level attitude. And then as the nozzles go down, you feel a deceleration initially as the pilot put the nozzles down. And as I said, the first time I did it, I was just flying as a passenger in the back. Um, I managed to sandbag a ride. And then as you slow down, it feels so unnatural because it's not doing what a normal airplane does, where the nose comes up and you're getting more and more waffly. Just sort of slow down. Uh, and then you're sitting there, you know, perched above the world, looking around in, in the hover. So it is very unusual the first time you do it. And of course, with time, it's, it becomes, uh, becomes more second nature. Do you still fly now? Oh yeah, I do. I still fly for a living. I fly for 2XL Aviation as a test pilot there and uh, very, uh, very enjoyable. I'm not quite ready to grow up and hang up my boots yet. And finally, do you ever get sick about talking about aviation? I never get sick about talking about aeroplanes, no. I think my wife gets sick about me talking about aeroplanes quite a bit, but uh, no, not at all.